Well, you can turn in your Bibles tonight to Revelation chapter 8. How we doing tonight, Wednesday night, Calvary Vista? All right. Praise the Lord for air conditioning, right? <laughs> Did any of you happen to see the, I think it was called the Biscuit Basin uh, thing that went off at Yellowstone yesterday? Anybody see that? Yeah. That's, I wish I would have saw it earlier. It would have been a great video for our study tonight because um, a little glimpse, I think, of uh, some of the things we're going to see here in chapter 8. Well, tonight we continue to look at the events of the great tribulation that will come upon the earth in the last days. And the Great Tribulation contains 21 major judgments. And we see these in the seven seal judgments in Revelation chapter 6, the seven trumpet judgments in chapters 8 and 9, and then the seven bowl judgments in chapters 15 and 16. And last Wednesday night, my friend, Pastor Barry Stagner, um, took you through six of the seal judgments. And the reason he didn't go into the seventh uh, seal being opened is because the seventh seal is what ushers in the seven trumpet judgments that we read about in chapters 8. Eight and nine, in much the same way that the seventh trumpet judgment ushers in the seven bowl judgments that begin in chapter 15. Now, there are some very well meaning Bible teachers who love Jesus, who love God's word, that like to suggest and teach that the great tribulation doesn't begin, doesn't start until chapter 15 and the bold judgments, and that everything prior to that is just tribulation, or sometimes it gets referred to as the wrath of the Antichrist or the wrath of uh, Satan, but not the wrath of God. Because that happens, they teach, later in chapter 15, which means the rapture doesn't happen until Revelation chapter 14, and that is what is known as the pre-wrath view of the rapture. And part of the reason why the pre-wrath view states that the great tribulation doesn't start until the bold judgments begin in chapter 15 is because we're told this in Revelation chapter 15 verse 1. It says this, and then I saw another sign in heaven. Great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. And so those who hold the pre-wrath view believe that the rapture happens when, before these bold judgments begin, and that the bold judgments really usher in the wrath of God. But everything prior to this, the seal judgments, the first of the six trumpet judgments, um, we, the church, actually experience that. That we're here on planet Earth during those times because there in chapter 15, verse 1, it, it says it's there that the wrath of God is mentioned. But I want you to notice closely, that verse should still be on the screen, that John, what he says here, he doesn't say the wrath of God has started. He says that it is complete, meaning that this is the end of it, the completion of it, meaning that what has occurred prior to this, the way I would interpret this, is was also the wrath of God. This is just the completion of it. This is just the end of it. And that has really been my argument all the way along as we've been studying the book of Revelation is that the tribulation starts in chapter six when Jesus opens the scroll and he looses that first seal. 
And what I keep advocating, and we're going to see this again tonight, is that everything that we are reading about in this tribulation period is originating from heaven. It's originating from the hand of Jesus as he opens the seal. And this to me is an example of what I mentioned on Sunday that Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 18 when he said, and the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. And he begins to describe how the wrath of God there in Romans chapter 1 is being revealed. And he mentions three different times that this is what the wrath of God looks like is it's God giving men over to themselves, giving them over to follow their own lusts. And we've noted that when the first seal is opened there in chapter six, it ushers in the coming of the Antichrist. And the the Antichrist is really the epitome of man living apart from God. It's the epitome of being anti-God and against God. It's, it's a man who is seeking to pursue his own kingdom and establish his own kingdom. And during the first four seals, as they're being opened, that, that you looked at last week, that we noted on Sunday morning, is that these first four seals, after the first four seals of judgment are opened, one quarter of the planet Earth is killed. That's about two billion people. And then we see the sixth seal opened and these cataclysmic things are happening on planet Earth. And my point has been, again, that everything that we have seen thus far in the book of Revelation, in the reading of the seal judgments, has been originating from the throne of God and from the hand of Jesus. That it's his wrath that is being poured out. Now, when it comes to the rapture of the church, there's basically three, well, four four views, but but the three that I I really think have any kind of merit whatsoever is the pre-trib view, which is the one that we hold here and that I hold. There's the mid-trib view. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get to chapter 11. And then there is the pre-wrath view that um, we'll see when we get to chapter 14. All of these views agree in this, that Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9, that the church is not appointed under wrath. They all agree with that. We're not appointed under wrath. But where they divide, though, is where the wrath begins. And the, the point that I have been making, and I will die on this hill, I think, until um, the Lord comes back or proves me wrong, is that the, the, the tribulation starts there in chapter 6, where everything we see is originating from heaven. Now, another thing that I'll mention is that there's also a teaching that says that the seal judgments, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl judgments are actually three different sets of, or are not three different sets of judgments. Again, let me say that, not three separate sets of judgments, but three different angles describing the same thing. Kind of like watching three different camera angles on an instant replay in a football game. And so it's like each one is giving a little bit more detail of the same thing. But I think Revelation 15 verse 1 also refutes that idea because notice again it says, and then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven, what does it say? Last plagues. And that means the seven last plagues would indicate that there have been previous plagues. And judgments, that these are just the last seven of them, which I think dispels that idea as well, that these judgments are different angles describing the same thing. Now, another thing to understand about the book of Revelation before we jump into chapter 8 is that, and, and this discussion of these 21 judgments, is that what has been called parenthetical chapters, 
parenthetical comes from the word parentheses, from which means something that is inserted as an explanation. It could also signal an interval or an interlude in the narrative. So each chronological section of the book of Revelation is immediately followed by what is called a parenthetical section. Because God, out of his pastoral heart, is intentionally pausing in the story to give his church explanation or to give some interpretive keys to what has just happened or what is about to happen. Now, some might ask the question, well, if we're not going to be here, why does it matter? Why does it matter for us? Why, why should we even care about any of these things? And I would say this. The Bible says that God does not want us to be ignorant of spiritual gifts. He doesn't want us to be ignorant of spiritual warfare. He doesn't want us to be ignorant concerning the nation of Israel. And he doesn't want us to be ignorant about Bible prophecy. He wants us to understand these things so that we can teach these things accurately but I also think this, I think the reason why it's important that we look at the events of the tribulation, even though I believe with all my heart, we are not going to be here, is because these things that we're looking at should motivate us more than ever to share our faith. And I've said this all the time. If you ever went to one of our prophecy updates, as I said, hey, the point of this prophecy update, and I would say this about the book of Revelation, the point of the book of Revelation is not to create within born-again believers and followers of Jesus Christ a mentality of escapism. If your mentality in reading this is one of like, you know, I mean, I'm so glad I'm going to miss it, that, and too bad, so sad for all the people in the world that are going to deserve this, that is not God's heart. That is not God's heart at all. No, this should create within us and, 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 and really well up within us a heart toward activism towards sharing our faith. It should be giving us a burden like we've never had before that people we work with and, and live by and love are gonna go through these things. And it should just create within us this sense of I don't want them to go through these things. In fact, I would even argue this, that if we were to go through some part of the tribulation, be it, you know, rapture happens mid-trib or, or pre-wrath, I would almost say that it would be almost less of a motivation to share our faith now. Because what's the hope? What's the comfort? What's the, you know, I, I think it would almost be a, a sense of like, you know, I'll just wait until all that stuff starts because I'll have much more of an active audience and attentive audience because things are going to be going so crazy. But my message is going to be, hey, give your life to Jesus so you don't go to hell, but you're probably going to die. Because that's really the message of those who are thinking we're going to go through really any part of the tribulation. We're going to die. But that's okay. Because from day one in my relationship with Jesus, I've been ready to die. To die for my faith. I'm ready to die now. And I think you can't really live for Jesus unless you're, really, you're ready and, and willing to die for Jesus. But I think when Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, when he's talking about the rapture, he's talking about the Lord coming, and he twice says in chapters 4 and 5, comfort one another with these words. I think the comfort is we get to miss this. So we have seen the, one of these parenthetical chapters already in chapter 7 last week when we saw the introduction of the 144,000, which are Jewish people from the 12 tribes of Israel, as well as the first group of martyred believers, those who come to Jesus after the rapture and during the tribulation, they're in heaven. And we'll see the other parenthetical sections are in Revelations 10, um, verse 1 through eleven fourteen, 
Revelation 12 uh, and through 14, those chapters. Revelation 17, 1 through 19, 10. And Revelation 21, 9 through 22, 5. These are kind of breaks in the narrative where the Lord is going to stop, pause, and give us some detail about what's happening. So we come to chapter 8 tonight. And chapter 8 begins with the opening of the final seal judgment. And our outline for the study today is this. We're going to look at the silence, the supplications, and the soundings. So we start with the silence, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Pause right there and give me your attention. Now, there's been a lot of speculation concerning why there was silence in heaven um, at this moment for 30 minutes. Some commentators believe that it's because the seventh seal, the title deed to the earth, is flipped over, revealing the whole plan of God and the rest of the judgments that are going to be laid out and recognized. And, and the reality of this and the enormity of this you know, judgment just causes, causes there to be a holy moment in heaven. Sort of a, 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 an awe and, and a soberness at what they are looking at and what is about to happen. Others think that this is hard evidence that women arrive in heaven at least 30 minutes after the men. <laughs> And the reason for that is they said if there were any women in heaven already, there's no way that there would be silence. <laughs> now, I don't believe that that's what this means, but that's what Pastor Steve believes, and he, he asked me to say this, so. <laughs> no, I think the truth is, the truth is that the seventh seal contains so much devastation it's so ominous what we're going to look at tonight that it leaves heaven speechless. That they're just speechless. And the silence just adds to the intensity of what's about to happen. Think of it this way. You've probably all experienced this. You're, you're watching a football game. And, and it's the fourth quarter. And there's seconds left in the game, and your team is on the goal line. It's like first and goal. There's two seconds left. There's time for one more play. If they score a touchdown, they win. If they get stopped, they lose. And as the ball is being high, everybody in the room is just silence, waiting to see what's going to happen. That's sort of like, I think, what's happening here in this moment in heaven. The silence is similar in that they're anticipating what is about to happen. Zephaniah, the prophet, actually spoke of this. He said in Ze Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 7, Be silent in the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. And anytime you see that phrase, the day of the Lord, understand it is not describing a single day, but the day of the Lord speaks of a time period that begins with the, the tribulation starting and goes all the way through the second coming and the millennial reign of Christ, that that whole time period is known as the day of the Lord. And Zephaniah says, be silent because the day of the Lord is at hand, and then he begins to describe the tribulation part of the day of the Lord when he says, the great day of the Lord, in verse 14, it should be on the screen, is near. It is near and hastens quickly, and the noise of the day of the Lord is bitter. There the mighty men shall cry out. The day is a day of wrath. A day of trouble and distress, a day of devastation and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fortified cities and against the high towers. I will bring distress upon men and they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, think about that, and their flesh like refuse. 
Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them. Money will mean nothing. In that day of the Lord's wrath, but the whole land shall be devoured by the fire of his jealousy. For he will make speedy riddance of all those who dwell in the land. It's heavy. So the silence is in anticipation of what is about to happen next as the wrath of God continues to be poured out. And that brings us to the supplications we see in verses two through five. He says, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God and to them were given seven trumpets and then another angel having a a golden censer came and stood at the altar And he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. And then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. Pause there and give me your attention. Now we've mentioned before that the tabernacle offers us a picture of what heaven is like. And one of the elements of the tabernacle that was before the ark of the Lord was the altar of incense. And it was there that a sweet incense created specifically for this type of offering that was to be used um, for, for nothing else, this offering to the Lord. In fact, Aaron the high priest would mix the incense with coals from the altar and take it with him into the Holy of Holies. And in the book of Leviticus, it tells us that it served as a protection for him in the presence of God's holiness. Here the incense, though, is mixed with prayers. And more than likely, these are the prayers of the saints that we saw in chapter 5, as well as the prayers of the martyrs that we saw in chapter 6, who were crying out for God's vengeance. Lord, how long until you avenge us? But I want you to note this. I think it's interesting that in the Old Testament, every time a sacrifice was offered on the altar, it was described as a sweet aroma to the Lord. This fascinates me. Because when you think of how God receives our prayers, what's the, which, which of the senses do you think of, when you think of God receiving our prayers, you think of hearing, right? You think of he hears our prayers, and that is true. The greatest thing, one of the most wonderful things, the thing that makes God stand out from all the other, you know, the Greek gods and all that, is that our God hears. When you pray, God hears. He hears our prayers, but this is giving us some insight that not only does he hear our prayers, but he smells them. He smells them. Isn't that a beautiful thought? That our prayers to God are a a sweet-smelling aroma. That that when our prayers are lifted up to God and our praise is lifted to God from, from the right heart, it smells good to him. It's a beautiful fragrance to him. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 141, verse two. May my prayer be set before you like incense. My lifting up of the hands be like the evening sacrifice. As we were praising God tonight, those those praises were going up to him as a sweet-smelling aroma. He's just like... Oh, loving Calvary Vista tonight. (laughs) Loving that smell tonight. That praise coming from pure hearts. And this is what the book of Revelation, don't miss this, keeps doing to us. We have these scenes of hell on earth happening. And we're going to keep seeing this. 
these scenes of, of hell being just unleashed or, or, or really, you know, this, the, the wrath of God being unleashed, these judgments being, being poured out. And we can look at that and think, man, that is so harsh. That seems so horrible. And there would be some that might even look at this and think, man, God must hate people on planet Earth. But nothing could be further from the truth. You see, God is like a doctor who's dealing with cancer, but really more than a doctor because not all doctors love their patients. Some doctors just do their jobs, but God loves his people, and the patient is planet Earth and its people, but some of the people are are so far infected that that they're just too far gone. But like a doctor, he's attacking cancer. God's attacking the, the cancer of sin and rebellion on planet Earth. And just like a doctor in seeking to treat cancer and attack cancer might start with one approach, and it might be less aggressive. He might try, you know, radiation, or he might try, you know, chemotherapy, and and he's trying to shrink that down so that that he can remove it. But if that doesn't work, if that's not not killing the cancer, then he's going to have to get more aggressive. And in essence, that's what we see God doing. He's getting, as this goes on, he's getting more and more aggressive as he's attacking the cancer. And from the vantage point of those on earth, it's like, man, this is brutal and intense. But from the vantage point of heaven, those who are the closest to God's heart, they're they're like, hey, yeah, this is intense, but it's coming from a heart of love and a motivation to save what's left. And that's, to me, the most beautiful thing about the book of Revelation is all the way through it, you see God going to great lengths to try to get the attention of people who are still here on planet Earth that they might turn to him and be saved. As he's seeking to eradicate the cancer and save the planet and as many people as he as possibly can, but he's dealing with the cancer and it gets more and more aggressive. So we see the silence, the supplications, and now we come to the soundings in verse 6. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And the first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. It's interesting that the first four of these trumpets that are sounded, these judgments that go forth have to do with nature. They affect the the land, the first the earth and then the cosmos. And we see a common number associated with all of these and that's the proportion of the ecological disasters stays the same. It's a third of everything is affected. The first trumpet, we see that there's hail and fire. Kind of an interesting combination that has actually been found today, been found, you know, in our world in volcanic explosions. In fact, it's interesting that the largest hailstone ever recorded has a circumference of about 17.4 inches. That's the size of a volleyball. Imagine that. Imagine those type of hailstones falling out of the sky, which could be the explanation for the line that says, and they were mingled with blood. Because (laughs) that's going to cause a lot of destruction. That's going to cause a lot of loss. Whatever this is, it brings much destruction, and a third of the trees and all of the green grass are burned up. It could also be the devastation that follows from volcanic ash. And think of all the impact that all the grass being burned up would have on farming life and cattle. 
And the question that, that I think is a little bit not clear, is this happening all over the earth or at uh, certain and specific regions? We see the second sounding, the second trumpet, it says in verse 8. And then the second angel sounded in something like a great mountain. Notice that. John uses these phrases all the time, something like. Something like a, a trumpet. Or something as, he mentioned in chapter 6, something as the, the, the sky being rolled up like a scroll. That, that's what it looked like to him. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but it was like this or it was as this. And here he, he's given the example of this. It, it looked like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. So John sees something like a great mountain on fire crashing into the sea. This sounds like a huge asteroid crashing into planet Earth. And it, 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 it crashes and, and hits the sea with such an effect that a third of the sea creatures die and a third of the sea becomes like blood and a third of all the ships on the sea are destroyed. Now, it's interesting that on any given day, there are 30,000 ships in the sea around the world. And so when this, if, it, if it's, you know, an asteroid, a, a mountain, you know, some huge mountain of an asteroid on fire coming down hits the sea, you know, that, that's about 10,000 ships being destroyed, carrying tens of thousands of passengers being killed. Then it says, verse 10, the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. And the name of the star is Wormwood. And a third of the waters become, became Wormwood. And many men died from the water because it was bitter. Now, some Bible commentators at this point think that this star, you know, because Wormwood, it means bitter, that this might involve some kind of a nuclear explosion, something happening um, in that type of realm, maybe the result of, of this, these other calamities, maybe the result of some of these, you know, earthquakes. And, and whatever it is, though, whether it's a literal star or a nuclear explosion, that, that the fresh water supply is... Affected, and again, many men, many people die. The Lord declared in Jeremiah 9, verse 15, because of the rebellion of his people, behold, I will feed them, this people, with wormwood and give them water of gall to drink. We come to the fourth angel sounding in verse 12. And it says, a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened, and a third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. So at this point, it seems that everything that is happening on planet Earth during this time is also affecting the atmosphere so that the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened and it's feeling like it's night all the time or what some would describe as a nuclear winter. And again, all of this, though, is originating from heaven from these angels that Jesus is dispatching. And whenever you think that God is using to bring these judgments about, the result is the same. A third of the trees are destroyed, a third of sea life is killed, a third of the rivers are polluted, and a third, the, the sun and the moon and the stars, it's a third less sun, it's a third less light on planet Earth. Then it seems that there's a short break that takes place in the action. We're not sure how long this is, but it's enough for this angel to be flying around declaring these woes. Look at verse 13. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. So this angel goes forth preparing the world and basically what he's saying is if you think this has been bad, you haven't seen anything yet. What's coming is worth. 
So we look at chapter nine and we see the fifth trumpet sounds. Then the fifth angel sounded and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. And so the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. This is almost like what, what, what that thing happened at Yellowstone looked like. You know, this smoke coming out of the pit to there yesterday. But chapter 9 opens with this fifth angel sounding his trumpet. And John says that he sees a star, another star, falling from heaven to the earth. But this is no ordinary star. This isn't like the star that we just saw crashing to the earth in in the fourth trumpet blast because in verse one, this star is identified as a he. Notice it says, to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now there's some speculation as to who this star might be. Some think that this is in reference to Satan himself. Others believe that it is a high-ranking angel. We're going to talk about this a little bit on Sunday, but did you know Satan doesn't live in hell? In fact, he has access to heaven. We'll we'll see that. We'll talk about that some in heaven. And so some believe that that this is Satan. Others believe a a high-ranking angel because in chapter 20, we read of an angel who's going to lock Satan up in the bottomless pits. So this might be the same angel who now is coming and he's unlocking the bottomless pit, which seems to be holding some really, really bad demons. And we learn from the book of Jude, as well as 2 Peter chapter 2, that there have been certain demons in the history of mankind that have been so foul that God has locked them up until this day. In Jude, verse 6, it says, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, he reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for judge, the judgment of the great day. That could be these demons. Peter mentioned this in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgments. Some believe that this could be these demonic creatures that are being let out at this time. But the fifth trumpet sounds, and the bottomless pit is open, and what comes out is so horrible. So horrific. I mean, think about this. Imagine all the prisons on planet Earth being opened up today and the worst criminals being released. Imagine how how crazy that would be. This is a lot worse. This is way worse. Notice verse three. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth and to them was given power as the scorpions have power and they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth. Now, some of you might think, wait, I thought the grass was all burned up. Why would they say, you know, well, it could be that by this time, a lot of it's grown back. That could be the explanation. Could be that when that first trumpet sound, you know, happened, it could be that it wasn't, it was only a part of the earth that was affected. Either way, there's some grass that they're told not to eat. Verse four says, they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or only tree, but get this, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So out of this smoke comes these locusts, but these aren't normal locusts, my friends. You see, locusts thrive on vegetation, but these locusts are commanded not to touch the vegetation, but instead they're gonna attack people. Except for those 144,000 Jews that have the seal of God on their foreheads. But notice verse five. And they were not given authority to kill them, that means to kill the men, but to torment them for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. I believe 
that these are demonic beings that are tormenting the people of the world. And I want you to notice how John proceeds to describe them. These aren't normal locusts. Verse 6. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. And they will desire to die and death will flee from them. And then notice this. The shape of the locust was like horses. Again, like. John's saying, I'm trying to describe what this looked like to me. Like horses prepared for battle. And on their heads were crowns of something like gold. And their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, so their hair's long, but their teeth were like the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle, and they had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men for five months. Now this is interesting because the actual lifespan of, of a normal locust is five months. And here the Lord is giving these, these creatures, I think they're demonic creatures that look like, you know, that kind of look like locusts. They're coming out of the earth. They're swarming in that way. He gives them five months to inflict mankind. Another thing that is different about these creatures from regular locusts is that they have a leader. Look at verse 11. And they had as, as a king over them the angel of the bottomless pit whose name in Hebrew is Abandon, but in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. Now it's interesting that in Proverbs 30 verse 27 it says the locusts have no king and yet they all advance in ranks. And this is one of the most amazing things about locusts as part of God's creation is they fly in formation without any leadership. It's kind of an amazing thing. But these again, these locusts, they're different. They have a leader. They have a ruler. They have a king, and his name in Hebrew is Abandon. In the Greek, it's Apollyon. And some believe that this is Satan himself. I, I personally don't think so because he comes from the bottomless pit, and Satan's not in the bottomless pit yet. He will be one day, but he has, he's not yet. So I don't think this is Satan, but maybe this is some type of high-ranking demonic destroyer. And I want you to notice verse 6 again, though. It says, in those days, men will seek death and will not find it, and will desire to die, and death will flee from them. This is what this is telling us. During this time, this is going to be so intense that people are going to be attempting suicide, but they're not going to die. They're going to be doing various things. And you can just use your imagination of what people might be trying to do to kill themselves to escape this, but they're not going to die. Guys, this is horrific. Do you want to be here for this? Do you want anybody that you love or know to be here for this? But it gets worse. Notice verse 12. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. Verse 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. Now, pause there. The, the horns of the golden altar were where the priests, when they were bringing the sacrifices to lay on the altar, they would tie the limbs of the animal to these four posts, these four horns. And the altar was the altar where, where the sacrifices were being given for the atonement of the sins. It was prefiguring this altar. It, it prefigured Jesus being fastened to the cross for us, paying the price for our redemption. And so John, again, he's hearing this voice that, that is once again, it's the voice of Jesus and it's coming from, from that which reminds us of his atoning sacrifice. Again, this is originating from heaven. Why? Because Jesus is the one orchestrating all of this. 
So John hears a voice, verse 14, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And so the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Now, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million, and I heard the number of them. So here we see some more fallen angels who were bound for some reason. We, we can't be sure this time somewhere under the great river Euphrates, but now they're released to destroy man. And these judgments pour out as God releases the the evil that is currently being held back. There's a certain evil, think about this, there's a certain evil right now in the bottomless pit and and, and this some type of prison, you know, under the great river Euphrates that is being held back right now. Held back because of of God's, the presence, I think, of God's spirit on the earth and and the presence of his church on the earth. And I'm thankful for that. Thankful that God is holding back. That we are living in a day and age where where he's not pouring this this out on us. And all the, the, the stuff that we see going on in our world today, all of the, the, the wickedness, all of the persecution happening in the world today, it's not the wrath of God. It's the hand of man against the people of God. But there's gonna come a day when God pulls back the restraints and... He's going to allow these beings, these demonic beings, to come on planet Earth. These four demons lead an army, notice, of 200 million. Now, I want you to think about that. There was a million soldiers gathered together for the Gulf War. This is 200 times that. There were 50 million soldiers fighting in World War II. This is four times that. Four times that. And even more incredible is the fact that when John writes this, there weren't even 200 million people on planet Earth at that time. So John is seeing something here. It's future. Now, some have tried to say that maybe this is China because, you know, a couple of years ago they announced that they were able to, you know, bring an army now of, of 200 million soldiers. I don't think this is China. I think this is a demonic army, an army of demons coming on planet Earth. I do think, though, that. There will be, we'll we'll read about this in chapter 16, an army coming from the east that joins with the Antichrist. That could be China. But a lot of people think that, that this couldn't be China because some don't think that there's that it would even be possible by this time to even have an army of 200 million people with all the devastation that's taken place. Second question people have is: well, why would this army if it was an army of men, be fighting against the whole world. But the language here doesn't seem to fit modern warfare. This is something else. Look at verse 17. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red and hastens blue and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire and smoke and brimstone. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind is killed. And by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths for their power is in their mouth and in their tails for their tails are like serpents having heads and with them they do harm. So some believe that just as with the fifth trumpet this is a demonic army from the pit of hell. And they set out to kill people on planet earth because that's what demons love to do you know jesus said of satan satan is a thief and a robber who comes to kill and to rob and destroy that's his mo that's what he's about satan is not your friend 
He wants to destroy you. He wants to kill you. Remember when, when Jesus comes upon that one man that was possessed with the demon, the, 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 the Gadarenes, lived in the tombs, and he had a legion of, of demons. And remember the demons begged Jesus, don't send us into the pit. Send us into those pigs. And Jesus says, okay, you can go into the pigs. Remember what they did? They ran the whole herd of pigs off a cliff into the ocean where they died. Because that's what demons do. Give us something to destroy. Give us something to kill. And here, they're unleashed and they kill a third of the population. Now, I want you to think about this. The current population today is about 10.3 billion people. Let's say a billion of those go in the rapture. Let's just hypothetically, I could maybe a little more, a little bit less, billion Christians on planet Earth. So that's 9.5 billion people left. And last week we saw in the fourth seal that a fourth of the earth's population was killed. So that's two billion killed. Here's another third of the remaining population killed. So that's close to another two billion people killed. So by this time, almost half the population of planet earth is gone. Just let that sink in for a minute. This is heavy. It's heavy. And we haven't even gotten to the bold judgments yet. Let that sink in. You see, this is gut-wrenching. This is really an impossible to imagine. It's hard, isn't it? It's like hard to fathom. It's hard to, to wrap our minds about around it. But here's what's really sad. Look at verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands. That they should not worship demons and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk, and they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, or of their sexual immorality, or of their thefts. Even after all of this, a lot of the people on planet Earth are not going to repent and come to the Lord. They're still holding on to their sin. They're still wrapped up in demon worship. They're still given over to idolatry. Idolatry is when we put anything in our lives above God. And we might not bow down and worship it and light incense to it, but, but we worship it because it's the most important thing in our lives. And there's a lot of people today in planet Earth who are, 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 who are, are idolaters, even though they don't even know it. There's a lot of people today that are worshiping Satan and, 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 and demons, even though they might, they're not like Satan worshipers. They don't have pentagrams you know, around their necks, but, but they're indirectly, by not directly, following Jesus. Jesus said, you're either for me or against me. There's no neutral ground. And these people, they're, they're just continuing on. They're murdering, they're killing, they're, they're into drugs. That's what sorcery speaks of. It's the Greek word pharmakia, from which we get our English word pharmacy. And they're being given over to sexual immorality. It's like nothing changes. And this really speaks to the hardness of heart and the propensity towards sin that is so great that it doesn't stop it grows and this is just another reminder to us of what Jesus said in John chapter 3 that men hate the light because they love their darkness and because their deeds are evil 
Now we read this and, and wonder, and maybe you wonder, well, why doesn't God just put an end to all of this? Why doesn't he just stop now? Like he did at the flood. You know, at the flood, he said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm picking six people and, and the rest. They don't want to enter the boat, you know? I mean, here's the interesting thing about the flood. It tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was preaching. How long did it take Noah to build the ark? How long? No, 120. 120 years. 120 years Noah's out there. Repent. There's a flood Come and Turn to the Lord. And people laughed at him. I mean, I, I, I can picture for the first probably few months, it's like he was the sideshow. Hey, kids, what do you want to do today? Let's go mock Noah, you know, and they'd, they'd go and watch him and his son's building, and what are you doing? And, uh, you know, he's preaching at them, and, and they're just laughing at him. It says they laughed until the door closed and the rain started coming down, and then they knew because it had never rained before. Water from the sky, Noah was saying, like, oh, that's ridiculous. Water doesn't come out of the sky. And so people wonder, what, how come, I mean, why doesn't God just do this? Why not just get rid of the rest of, of the population? And here's why, that's not God's heart. What is God's heart? I'll close with this. Joel chapter two, verse 10, and it'll be on the screen, says this. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me, with all of your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind them? That's God's heart. All the way along, he's, return, repent. He says, hey, don't just rent your garments. You see, that's what the, the, the people, the Jewish people would do when they experienced, you know, uh, great sorrow, and it was kind of an outward sign of their repentance is they would tear their clothes. But the problem was is their hearts were still far. And God was saying, like, don't, don't go through the motions, and I want to say that to us. Let's not, let's not be people that just go through the motions, that play church, that, that just you know, say the right things, but our heart isn't right. God says, don't just rent your garments. You need to rent your heart. God, even after all of this, wants his people to repent. I'm gonna ask the band to come up right now. You know, the Bible tells us that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the same God that just doesn't do away with people but wants them to repent and turn from their sin and get right with God, he's the God that feels the same way about you and me. He feels that way about us tonight. Because sometimes we can get wrapped up in our own idolatry, can't we? We get our eyes off of God. We get wrapped up in other things. We start putting, maybe it's a person, maybe it's a, a spouse, maybe it's we, we put someone else a, above God. Maybe you're wrapped up in, you know, people get wrapped up in sorcery. They're, they get involved in drugs, alcohol addiction. Even Christians get wrapped up in immorality, pornography, sexual immorality. And here's the thing that God wants us to understand. All of those things that we can get wrapped up in will devastate us. They can destroy us. Sin affects our relationship with God. And God, because he loves you, will not let you live in your rebellion. He'll chasten you. He'll seek to get your attention because his heart is that you would repent, that you would turn from your sin and that you would turn to him. And this is what he promises this, if we turn to him, he'll restore us. 
He'll forgive us. He'll bring life to our barrenness. The people in this day, what we're reading about that's going to happen in Revelation chapter 8, they are going to be destroyed. But we still have time. We still have time. 